And if you look at the program, the title that uh, Teresa has here for me, the concept of commons in the Rio Grande watershed. It's a slightly a little different from what I have up there. But I like the way Teresa have phrased it. She, I guess, intuitively knew what the major theme was going to be here because she titled it the concept of commons in the Rio Grande watershed. And I think that starts to explain what I'm about to present, that uh, watersheds in the western states, the western region, uh, we kind of look at them as watersheds, but politically, legally, they are not. You know, we know that the western states uh, is carved up into pretty large sized territories, eventually becoming incorporated into the Union. Uh, New Mexico itself was one of the last ones to be incorporated in 1912, as was Arizona. Uh, so, you know, but we have some uh, precedents for thinking about the western region, the arid lands of the west, as was reported by John Wesley Powell in his report about, you know, 1875 or so, uh, that this was his concept uh, about what the western region, he recognized it immediately as arid lands uh, of the west in the United States, and he concluded uh, in his report to the U.S. Congress that uh, you know, without irrigation, uh, settlement would just not be possible uh, in the western region as represented in his colored map here. Each color on his map represents a, a different region. And so, had he had his way, then truly uh, the watershed, the drainage areas, you know, uh, by major rivers and streams, you know, the land that's drained, uh, if we could define a watershed that way, um, all of these would be the boundaries, essentially, of, of settlement. Uh, instead, uh, you know, the political boundaries of states were already drawn in this map. Obviously, by that late, the states were already here. Colorado was already incorporated into New Mexico and Arizona, not quite yet, but they were under territorial uh, jurisdiction. And it was his view, John Wesley Powell, uh, that uh, for settlements, really, uh, these would become what he called irrigation uh, municipalities. Essentially, that municipalities would would be fed, and and uh, you know the drainage systems would be the boundaries of municipalities from which they then uh, develop agriculture. He saw, including in his view, small scale agriculture, not the large commercial scale that we see, for example, in California. Uh, small scale agriculture, and based on what he called cooperative labor that it would not be possible for a single farmer irrigator to develop uh, even a, a you know, local or regional scale canal system and that these then would require cooperative labor. Uh, well, instead of uh, the uh, commons, you know, the western states being divided up into the drainages and the commons as in the earlier map, this is what actually, fast forward, you know, has happened. These are the pretty much those same western states that were on his map. And so you can tell that these are obviously not the irrigation uh, municipalities that John Wesley Powell had in mind, uh, but instead these are uh, large urban centers, you know, mega cities in many cases, such as Denver, uh, Phoenix, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, some of the others that are represented there. Uh, now, all of these cities, uh, as then and now, of course, depend on the rivers and streams that uh, come off of the Rocky Mountains in particular, and uh, the Colorado River, for example, is a huge drainage basin, uh, and, uh, but all of its water is already appropriated. You probably know about that. There's no new uh, water you know, in the Colorado system, and uh, not likely to be any more new water, uh, because there's actually a decrease in the flow, and there's a decrease in the snowpack in, throughout the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, California, you probably heard about, uh, it's about its fourth year of continuous drought. Its reservoirs are low. Uh, there's, there's threats on food supply. Uh, there's possible price increases uh, in agriculture. Uh, even the Pacific Northwest, which we think of as a very uh, humid you know, place, it's uh, high mountain areas, uh, even the Pacific Northwest has uh, decreased snowpacks. Certainly closer to home in our case, the San Juan Mountains that are in Colorado actually supply water to our largest city, the city of Albuquerque, now depends about 60% of its water actually comes from the Colorado River. Even though we're not there, our drainage is the Rio Grande, as you probably know. 
but I'll get to that in a minute as to how we have become dependent on uh, the shrinking amount and decreasing amount of flows in the Colorado River. Let's think about this globally a little bit. You know, we know that uh, approximately 1% uh, of uh, the Earth's uh, uh, feasible, accessible freshwater supply, that's all it is. So we look at the vast oceans and other glaciers and other places of, of uh, water resources, groundwater included, but uh, for uh, fresh water, only about 1% is available and accessible. Added to that and exacerbated by that are the effects of climate change that we have seen in, in recent years. I talked about California's drought now going into its fourth year, and that's exactly the same cycle of drought that we are experiencing in, in New Mexico and in Arizona. And under some of these uh, emissions, higher emission scenarios uh, into the rest of this century, uh, the higher the emissions, the, the uh, less re reduced spring precip precipitation, you know. And also, this, we could have a climate change map there and show the same result. And in fact, the, the bullseye for climate change effects is actually right there in New Mexico and Arizona, ex expected to have the most severe consequences of climate change. Uh, in New Mexico itself, uh, what water we do have coming from the Rio Grande, essentially, and also the Rio Chama, the Rio Pecos, uh, uh, those are our major uh, streams in our state. Uh, but as you can see in this chart here, most of it uh, actually is used in irrigation. It's actually used in agriculture. Some of it is commercial scale agriculture, such as the Mesilla Valley near uh, in, in Las Cruces and Paso. Uh, and uh, some of it in small scale irrigation in what Moises uh, referred to in his presentation, these community uh, canals, community ditches called in Spanish acequias. So, in terms of uh, population growth, which we have our share of population growth, uh, perhaps not as much as some of those other western cities like Las Vegas and Phoenix and Tucson, but Albuquerque is one of the growth centers uh, in our region. It has been for ever since World War II, and uh, that is expected to continue. Uh, well, where is the water going to come from? Well, uh, if most of the water is 66%, uh, sometimes they uh, uh, statistics uh, show up to 75% is actually in agriculture, not necessarily in those small community ditches, but certainly in terms of total agriculture, which includes commercial agriculture. If that's where the water is, then that's where the, it's going to have to come from. Now, however, who owns the water? You know, in these western states, the same ones that were up in that first map, uh, the water is uh, largely by a priority date, basically first in time, first in right that whoever first diverted the water has the most senior right and has the first right to any water uh, compared to junior diversions that uh, would have to be shut down and shut off, you know, in the case of scarcity or, or drought or water shortages. Well, we have our uh, quite a diverse uh, set of stakeholders. Uh, New Mexico has had, uh, you know, settlements uh, for uh, centuries uh, and uh, certainly the Pueblos and Navajo, the Apache, this is their homeland as well, in addition to some of the uh, Hispano Mexicano communities that Moises was describing as well. And so, over time, over centuries really, uh, this ownership of water has had to be divided up according to this priority date. The oldest uh, right is, is the best right and has the most protection. So, no surprise, the Pueblo and Indian tribes in New Mexico are Aboriginal. Uh, they have protected rights, either federally preserved rights through the Winters Doctrine or by way of the Pueblo land grants that, that were also conceded to the, uh, to, the, to the Pueblos. So they have the senior most water rights and they're protected. Uh, also, of course, the municipalities as population growth and residential development, especially after World War II, because uh, as I mentioned, New Mexico did not become a state until 1912. And uh, in the Congress, as debate was going on as to whether New Mexico should become a state and be elevated from territory to state, there were two questions that were asked of the uh, delegates from New Mexico. You need more water and you need more people, essentially. Well, you know, how do you make more water? Well, those were the federal reclamation projects that built Elephant Butte and built the Rio Grande project and all the other diversions that we have today. In terms of people, eventually the people came, people followed the water. And so now we have a whooping amount of 
uh, two million people, you know, sounds very small compared to the population figures that we, uh, we heard about China and uh, some of the other countries around here, but we do have about two million people and uh, quite a few of them are in the larger uh, metropolitan areas in the population and growth centers. Our rural counties, outlying counties, generally are either holding steady, they're not growing, or some are actually losing population. Of course, there's also another stakeholder is industry and economic development and jobs. You know, we have a major Intel plant just outside above Albuquerque near Rio Rancho, and um, you know that's where some of the water is used. It's moving water to higher values, supposedly, to where the jobs are, and taking it out of agriculture. So just like in China, we have our uh, loss of farmland being converted into industrial municipal uh, uses. Uh, we also have this small-scale agriculture, the, what I would call the uh, acequias, uh, and I'll be talking more about those as I move down. We have recreational uses. Uh, there's canoeing, there's rafting, there's fishing, there's boating, and those kinds of things. Usually urban people, you know, they like to do that, and so they, they, uh, they are one of the stakeholders. And last but not least, for sure, are the environmental flows that a lot of them are for protection of endangered species. We have a federally listed uh, endangered fish species called the civilry minnow, and in court cases that have been decided, uh, they also have protected and, and first priority rights over many other stakeholders. So what's being done about this water supply in this commons that uh, is kind of like an elusive concept? Um, well, New Mexico has divided itself up into 16 water planning regions. These are the ones currently developing a new water plan for the year 2015. Uh, and uh, the uh, one that I'm going to focus on a little bit here is for the middle Rio Grande. And why that one? Well, that's where the Albuquerque metropolitan region is. That's our largest population base. And, uh, you know, that's where uh, a lot of uh, growth is going to continue. It's, it's not going to be in the small rural areas. This happens to be a mountain village uh, in Cruchas, uh, outside near Santa Fe. Uh, it's, and uh, it's, it's Santa Fe itself has already become one of the uh, large water users. This is the old-fashioned traditional uh, diversion, uh, using water only when it's at the surface and only for uh, irrigation and return flows to the river and recharge. Uh, this is some of the human capital that's used to clean out these uh, ditches. Our study area for research has been funded by the National Science Foundation. This is the Upper Rio Grande. And we're particularly interested in the confluence of the Rio Grande with the Rio Chama. We have developed a, a scheme here or a strategy for uh, kind of sharing information across stakeholders. We really believe that one way to get agreement and get water sharing and look at water in the snowpack as a commons is to have shape the stakeholders, you know, share information, access to the same data. So one of our responses, in addition to qualitative data, we also are presenting visual, visualization. Uh, tools and techniques that are developed by Moses Gonzalez and his students, and I'll just show you a few of them that we think will kind of illustrate uh, changes that have happened even in our small communities, 1935 aerial maps to uh, more con low, uh, contemporary maps, and you can see that there's encroachment in some of these agricultural fields even in, in the small uh, towns. Uh, during that period. 1935 was important because that was a game changer uh, for New Mexico right after World War II. Prior to that, these 1935 maps were pretty much the way it was under subsistence uh, agriculture. I mentioned the uh, uh, Bureau of Reclamation projects. Well, in 1947, uh, there was a map here about developing a huge reservoir that would bring Colorado River water. I mentioned that at my start that I would get to that. And that's exactly what this project did. It uh, carved a tunnel underneath the Continental Divide uh, called the Azotea Tunnel, and they uh, brought Colorado River water into a reservoir called Heron Dam, or Heron Reservoir, that blue spot there on the, on the screen to the left, and then transported it to these uh, water users uh, downstream. The city of Albuquerque uh, has claimed to about half of all the imported water it's going to go to Albuquerque, already is. Albuquerque depends about 60% of its water supply from Colorado, and it's by way of this uh, uh, distribution of water. Santa Fe is another one uh, that benefits from that water. It's stored at Heron Reservoir initially, down to Envado, down to Abiquiu, uh, and eventually here. 
Now this is a 1935 map of Albuquerque, so you can see that Albuquerque itself was built more or less along, along the old style, you know, development along the river and the acequias. There were plenty of acequias thriving at this time. A lot of it was irrigated land, like Moises was explaining in the old city corridor here along the Rio Grande. But you can see the, the satellite image of Albuquerque now in terms of uh, the growth that has happened. Growth in Albuquerque, that's Bernalillo County, but also Sandoval County nearby for Rio Rancho, uh, Santa Fe County, and Valencia County. This is the type of development in Albuquerque going on right now. Obviously, it's sprawl development, and water needs to be put, uh, transported here. Uh, I mentioned that the city is getting 60% of its uh, water supply from the Colorado as surface water. Uh, in, in, since it has 40% yet to be captured, the city is looking at injecting that water into the aquifer to save it and put it in a, a, a underground reservoir in effect and be able to draw on it in future years. The problem with that in future years, uh, the Vento Rio Grande area is going to be blacktop and the, uh, the diversity for species, both plant and wildlife, uh, are going to be erased and uh, most of the species diversity is going to be in the north where the small uh, towns are. Lastly, there's also a problem with forest fires. You may have heard of Las Conchas fire, of the huge fire in New Mexico a few years ago. And during that time, this is what happened to the water, drinking water supply for Albuquerque. They had to shut down the pumps that came off of the surface water there and shut them down for about two weeks. And uh, this might happen under climate change effects as well. And very lastly, here's a brand new uh, poss possible project. It's called the Santolina. It is a, a master plan that's being proposed on the western side of the city, southwestern section. You can say it's pretty huge compared to what's already there. Uh, and it, it's the build out on this is, is, is supposedly in the master plan about 95,000 people. So where's the water going to come from? And uh, that's why I titled this uh, topic is the water commons as a concept that it's our belief that it's time to share water across the regions, not just the urbanized counties that I mentioned of, of uh, Sandoval, Burnley, and Valencia, but also sharing water with the northern counties, which is where the headwaters and these small uh, community ditches are located. Uh, so with that, I'll close and just uh, uh, you know give the contact information here uh, for uh, people to, if they want to get a hold of us. Uh, I think I skipped it too much, but Moises Gonzalez is a uh, co-presenter and a, a co-investigator in this project, and along with three of our graduate students. So thank you.